every Friday. Every day, my wife would call. Make sure she made contact with John. If she did not hear it for one day, she would call the, the person who was in charge of the other group. She would call the school. She could not sleep. It doesn't matter what time of the night. She had to hear some word from his um, roommate, somebody. She had to call. There's nothing like a mother's love. Amen? Amen. You know, Ellen White says, and, and as men, this is difficult for us to understand. Ellen White says that a mother's love is the closest that comes to the love of God for a children. A mother's love is amazing. I came across this story where this young man who was uh, very wealthy and he fell in love with this uh, beautiful girl who was uh, very poor. Uh, but she was very beautiful and, and they, they got along with each other. And, uh, but he was also very close to his mother. And in, uh, in, in that culture, the young lady felt a bit estranged that he had reserved some love for his mother. And he did not love her wholeheartedly. And she said to him, uh, in order for you to prove your love to me, I need you to do something to prove that you really love me. Go and kill your mother. And bring her heart for me. He contemplated that, that, that idea, and, and, but his love was so strong for this, this girl that he banished the thought and, now this is just a parable, okay? This is not a true story, it's a parable. He went and he kills his mother, and he takes out the heart and he's running towards his girlfriend to, to to bring her his mother's heart to prove that he really loves her. And while running, the heart fails and, and he's all dusty and, and he looks at the heart and he picks it up and, 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 and then he begins to go on his journey and, and there's a voice that comes from the heart, Son, are you hurt? Son, are you hurt? A mother's love. It's truly amazing for a children. But God, God's love surpasses the love of a mother. Amen. The mother's love is but a dim comprehension of the love of God. The love of God will be our theme throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Amen. When you read the, the story about the, the passion of Christ and, and leading up to the crucifixion and, and Jesus with, with a look or, or a word or with a thought, he could come and worship. Because there was never a time when he was not God. Amen? Amen. And then he said, Father, forgive them. Can you hear the hammering? The nails being driven, the spikes to his hands and feet. And yet he says, Father, forgive them. Oh, what love. Amazing and marvelous is the love of God. No one that Jesus asked of us, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. It's something that's, that, that we do not now possess. And don't kid yourself, friend of mine. Loving your enemies is difficult. As a matter of fact, if we don't get the victory over this, there is no way we can make it through those pearly gates. Amen? Amen? Loving our enemies is a power outside of ourselves. Who is an enemy? An enemy is someone who hates you regardless of their thoughts or your thoughts towards them. The person who hates you, mistreats you, you know people in your life's orbit, I'm not going too far outside the bond, are people within your boundaries. 
They use words to hate you, actions to harm you, regardless of whether they, as I said, whether they might be near or far. If people who disrespect, who disrespects you, refuses to respect your rights of property, your rights of personal security, an enemy is one who pressure and coerce you to force you to do what you don't want to do. Jesus said, pray for them. You have an enemy. An enemy is, is one who, who hates you when they, you remember that aggressive driver? Uh, you remember that, that aisle in the, in the grocery store, my brother? They coming up the wrong aisle and you toss towards them. Jesus says, love them. Amen. It's so nice to see you today. Amen. In temper and in tone. Remember someone who disrespects your, your wife or your husband or your children? Jesus said, love them. Amen. It's not easy, but it's possible by God's grace. Yes. If Je no, no, Jesus never asked of us that which he did not accomplish. Amen. He did not only come to die for us, he came to show us how to live. Amen. We talked about it in the lesson study this morning. Amen. That unfriendly clerk, that neighbor who is hard to live with, the employee who accuses you unjustly, the person who stole from you, a teacher who had it out for you in high school. Amen. The person who abuses you, stole your childhood, your innocence, who hurts you emotionally, physically, spiritually. Here Jesus asked the impossible. Love your enemies. How can we? The person who hurts us, harass us, harm us, hinder us, to seek to bring about our demise, who are haughty and hellish, who have broken your heart, the person whom you have been honest and honorable with, and they have been nothing but dishonest and dishonorable, how can we love them in temper and in tone? Your, your, your spouse's new ex, and the one who divorced you and got married to some floozy, I mean somebody who is that beautiful young person, not as nice as you, but how can you love your spouse's new ex? It goes uh, against our grades, amen? The in-laws and the outlaws. Difficult to live with. How can you love them? I'm just talking within the boundaries of those who know those who we are acquainted with. You see, back in the days of Jesus, the rabbi's teaching was to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now you can understand why when God said to Jonah, go, he said no. Because the people of Nineveh were the enemy. Nothing that would please him more and to see them lost and burning in the fires of hell. When you read the story of Jonah, everything obeyed God. Everything obeyed God. The bush, the worm, the ocean, the wind, even the sailors aboard the ship who worship a pagan God, they worship the true God. They obey the true God. Amen. Now, now, now Tarshish was known for his underground mines. Jonah was not just going in the opposite direction. He was going far away from everybody who knew him. There is no place that we can run and hide from God. Amen. As a matter of fact, some of us are hiding from God right in church. Because the word of the Lord comes to us. Saying to us, arise. And we all said, Well, that doesn't impress me. That's not my calling. How do you know? Amen. We are stifling the voice of the Holy Spirit. God asks of us.
things that are unpleasant. As a matter of fact, God disturbs us with his word. He makes us uneasy, uncomfortable, because we are busy doing our own thing, and that's what sin is. Sin is when you want to do your own thing instead of doing God's thing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Having our own way. God always disturbs us. When the word of the Lord comes, it's always to arise from our slumber, from what we are doing. God interrupts us. If you notice, the people that God calls are always people who are busy, who are, who are productive, who are genius, who, are, who, who, are, who have set goals, who are, who are about doing the things in life. Everyone that God calls, amen? amen? God is not so interested about people who are lazy, amen? Who are sitting down always. God disturbs us, He interrupts us. Because He has a mission for you and I, the highest calling, amen? It's a privilege, you know, to be called by God. I'm sure all of us could remember what we were doing, where we were, when we heard the word of the Lord. Many of us were not sitting idle. Is that right, Manny? We were busy about our own business. Amen? We had our goals to make lots of money. But God calls us. That people, that individual who stole from you, it could be 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Jesus says, love your enemies. If they take away your coat, give them your cloak also. Amen? Amen. Give them your tunic. If they stole from you, don't ask it back from them. And that person who didn't pay them the mortgage, the rent, the house, the apartment you're renting, they did not give you a month's rent, or two months or three months, who use you. I'm trying to make it practical, amen? amen. Love your enemies. How can we? I'm talking to all of us, amen? amen? I did jobs for individuals back in Miami, and, and they sure changed me hundreds of dollars. And then they look at me and smile. It takes the grace of God. Amen. It's not easy, but it's possible. Amen. By God's grace. Yeah, life, life is amazing. You can just smile. Amen. Amen. Why? <laughs> Why get angry? Amen. Life is like a journey. And the love of God makes the trip worthwhile. Amen. The experiences in life, what have passed you, have met you as yet, amen? Maybe you haven't lived long enough. But we are going to be tested and tried against our grace. We're going to have to do the impossible that Jesus asked of us. How will we be able to make it? Only by His grace and mercy. There are people right in our church. We can't get along with I mean, I've, known, I've been to a lot of churches. I uh, remember one day I went up to Tennessee. Uh, I've been up there a couple of times when I live in Miami. I went to this all-white church, and this lady said to me, you are so dark, where are you from? She never said happy Sabbath. She never greeted me. I said, brother, it's so nice to see you. It's, it's a blessing that you're in God's house of worship. You're so dark, where are you from? I just had a smile, amen. I went to another church and the first thing the guy said to us, where are you guys from? Do you have any way to go for lunch? Oh, we are so happy to have you. Uh, we'd love to have you join us for lunch. Difference. Everything that happens to you is not about you. Amen. See, God allows trials to come to us so that he can we can form characters so that we can be fitted for eternity. Yeah. Amen. The only reason why we exist is to form characters for eternity. That's why God gives us 70 years. And if for us, or if by reason of strength, it's with dotage and old age. But He has given us 70 years to decide to make up our minds 
whether we want to spend eternity with him or not. Amen? Amen. And to be a blessing to those around us. You know, we, we, we like a good comeback. Now, I, I'm not saying don't try, don't restrain the hand that is trying to harm you, amen? But whatever we do, according to Jesus, we need to do it in love, amen? amen. Even when you spank your children when they were small, you need to do it in love. <laughs> Never spank your kid when, when you're angry. You, we say things and we do things when we are angry that we will regret. And it's difficult for us as men to say we are sorry. It's difficult as human beings to say we are sorry. If we can just walk away, you know, in order to get the wind out of an angry man's sail, all you need to do is stay calm. And remember, the emptier the pot, the quicker the boil. A person who can go from zero to a hundred in a split second, the pot is empty. The emptier the pot, the quicker the boil. But you know, we like a good comeback. The story is told of Martin Behan. While he was driving 60 miles per hour, he saw in the distance two sparrows fighting. And as he approached, as he got closer, they rose up in fierce combat with each other. And there was a smash against his windscreen, leaving a smear of blood and feathers. And as he drove past by, he said, I don't know what they were fighting about. They were so preoccupied in their battle with each other that they were unaware of the greater danger before them. He said, I'm not sure what they were fighting about, but it sure wasn't worth losing their lives over. We are fighting with petty situations, petty things, that we are unaware of the greater danger. We fight and we fuss and we quarrel and we argue, and sometimes we forget what we are fighting about. And little do we know that we can lose our souls. I've met individuals in, in prison who have no stigma attached to their record. No past history of violence. It takes a split second, just a split second, to come in the untickle. And some of some of them have some of them are there for murder because of that split second. They have lost it. Moment by moment, minute by minute, day by day, we need to allow God to be in control of our lives. Friend of mine, I've seen it, I've known it. It happened in my life. I know what I'm talking about. I'm not telling you what I heard from somebody else. I used to love to get into fights. Somebody just say something. I used to be a rebel, friend of mine. It takes a split second. I remember Gene, who was in there for murder because of a, an argument that he, he choked his wife oh, Lord. and it was too late. Oh, Lord. He had to live. He could not, he, now that he had come to Christ, he was baptized in the first baptism, he could not go back and say, I'm sorry. He could not. He had to live for the rest of his life. With regrets. It pays, it pays to stay close to Jesus. Mm -hmm. There are many individuals who are rotting away in prison who, who will never get out of prison because they were in control. Jesus was not in control of their life. Christ, it doesn't matter the trial, he was in total submission to his father. And make no mistake about a friend of mine, it doesn't matter how, how much scripture you know. You can quote all the scripture you want, sometimes it doesn't seem to help. Amen. 
I think about John the Baptist who was in prison. Yeah. And of whom Jesus said there was never a greater than John the Baptist who proclaimed the first coming of the Messiah. John the Baptist was a no-nonsense preacher. He, was, he pointed his finger at the king and said, You are living in sin. Amen. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who is taken away the sin of the world. And while he was in solitary confinement in prison, he said, Do we look for another? Or is he the one? Do we look for another? Wouldn't I be better off working with him out there? Why is there no visit? Jesus never visited John in prison. He felt alone. He felt like giving up. There, there comes a time at our greatest child we feel like giving up. And all of us are going to be tested and tried, friend of mine. How will we fear? You know, when, when I present these messages, I wonder to myself, where are, the, where are the members of the church? You are missing out on eternal gems that you will never get again because time lost can never be regained. We can never buy that lost time. And we, we, we trivialize it. And we make slight of it. It's just church. But the congregation of Jesus many times was a congregation of one. And eternal gems of truth were spoken to one individual, never underestimate the coming together of brethren of like mind. Amen? Amen. Because there might be something spoken in this message, not just necessarily by me, but by any one of the presenters. Something might, might be of, of strength and of source and be a blessing. Some months or some years, you will remember that I received the word of the Lord. Amen? What a privilege it is to hear the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. We make sense of it. The word of the Lord, not the word of a president or a king or a prime minister, it's the word of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. What a privilege it is to hear. Whenever I've been asked to speak, it's a dawning responsibility. I do my homework, amen? I don't prepare the night before. I spend time. Do you, do you know what that mind says? That the Spirit of God with, is with you in your preparation. Yeah. When you get up to speak, He accompanies you. If you put nothing in, you'll get nothing out. The Spirit of God accompanies you when you go to present the Word. He's there with you in your preparation. Amen? Yeah. When the sailor was in the storm, and the sailors aboard the ship were crying out, and the sailor was calm and self-contained. They said to him, how could you stay so calm? He said, I prayed when it was calm. My duty now is to steer the ship. When the storm comes, it's too late. We've got to pray when it is calm. Amen? Because the giant is on its way. Amen? It's a blessing, friend of mine, to be used by God. Amen? Amen. Sarcasm and insults are not compatible with the love of God. Some have even coined the phrase, revenge is sweet. Something that insulting people and having a good comeback is to earn favor with God. John Astor's wife, who was a great financier, said to Winston Churchill, Mr. Churchill, if you were my husband, I would flavor your coffee with poison. <laughs> Churchill replied saying, Madam, if I were your husband, I would drink it. <laughs> we like a good comeback. John Randall met Henry Clay on the sidewalk in Washington. Clay said, Randall, I do not step aside for a scoundrel. Clay replied, I saw so the other hand always do, and he stepped aside. 
we like a good comeback. The story is told of one actress who wrote a book and she met another actress and uh, the other actress said, I enjoyed your book. Who wrote it for you? <laughs> and the other one replied, I did. Who read it for you? <laughs> we like a good comeback. We like a good insult. Jesus is not talking about our comebacks. Amen. Amen. A blessing, a blessing, friend of mine, is a spoken message for the other person's good and prosperity and health and happiness. That's a blessing. We can speak blessing in the lives of others. Yes, you know, we can say God and God loves you too with a very sarcastic voice. And so do I. I'm talking about in temper and in tone. Amen? Yes. Even in our business transactions, what's in it for me? You know, Jesus knows whether we are sincere or not. Amen? There's nothing we can hide from God. Amen? Amen? When Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, he said, we have left everything. What's in it for us? You know, and, you know, Jesus is so amazing. He said in this life, in the here and now, a hundredfold in this life, and in the life to come, eternal life. A young minister was introduced to a new church. And he met the oldest member of the church. And he was 90 years old and he said to the young minister, I don't have an enemy in the world. And the young minister said to him, that's amazing. The old guy said, I outlive them all. You love your enemies, you would outlive them all. Amen. I don't have an enemy in the world. See, friend of mine, I'm saying this to say that God estimates our love for Him. Not by those we love the most, but by those we love the least. God estimates our love for Him not by those we love the most, but by those we love the least. In, the, in as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. What good have we done if we love those who love us? Doesn't the publicans do the same? But loving your enemies, you know, the, 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 the Greeks thought that they have discovered the epitaph, what love really was. When the beautiful ancestors was willing to die for her handsome lover, Admetus. But when Paul came along, he said, that's not the real thing. Jesus was willing to die for those who did not love him, Amen. who were his enemies. He said, that's the true love. Amen. That's the acid test of love. Amen. You know, I can't love Jesus. Amen. 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 I have not been for his grace and mercy. I don't know where I would be today. I don't know what I would be doing. I had one of the worst tempers in the world. I have marks all in my, embedded in my body, all in my head. And cut up all over, getting into fights. But God is the God of second chances. Amen? God loves us, friend of mine. He loves every single one of us. We are precious, we are important. You can read the entire story, uh, just four chapters. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying the same thing, Arise, go to the river that bids him, and cry against him. When the word of the Lord comes to us, friend of mine, it does not change. The United States government, uh, 
and governments around the world have spent billions of dollars trying to put man on the moon. They have not spent a dime trying to bring the moon down to man. God will not come down to our level. He brings us up to Him. God's standard will never change. We are not to compromise with the truth. 